I lost over $100 million because of one bad assumption. How do you manage being and giving all people all things at all times, it seems like? It, right, it seems that way. And that's the key, is you have to make everyone in their perspective. So although I'm uh, what other people would call working, I've included my family in this so much. And I also not only am present, but I show appreciation. Let me give you an example. I have branded myself and live by the 520 rule. Five minute, me five minute phone calls, 20 minute meetings. But if you show up and are completely engage with someone right. you don't need it's not the amount of time it's the quality of time yes. favorite thing was going to the game just me and him yeah we, we, right we I, I had two guys with me but he i purposely sat him to my left on the aisle so and i during the game i was mostly engaged i see dads do this all the time they take their sons to the game but they're looking to their right the whole time to the guys that they're doing business with anyway and having phone calls. Right. It's okay to engage and bring people to a game for hospitality and for business development. But if you're going to bring your kid, he's number one. Because remember, they don't listen to you, they watch you. That's right. And when you make them the priority over, you know, presidents of companies and, you know, that's a big deal to him. And he, I could tell, that was his favorite thing. And it wasn't because it was you saw it on TV. It wasn't because the NBA Skills Day was that exciting. It was because I got there. I immediately told those guys, "Hey, I'm taking Miles into the store, and we're gonna get some cool stuff." Then Miles, what do you want to eat? Miles, you sit here, and my arm was here, and I was only 90% of the time engaged with him, going, "Did you see that?" Just present. Yeah, and I see I see that mistake by dads and moms all the time. They think they're going with their kids somewhere, but if you're not engaged in paying attention to them and you know really participating, then don't take them. Right. Because you're just hurting their feelings. Yeah, they can watch it on TV. Yeah, without you. Without you. Yeah. Well, I love that we have a lot of the similar background. You've got a doctor brother that's <laughs> suitably highly educated yeah. and intellectual, is, is intellectual, and all those things. I've got a brother who went to Stanford, got his MBA, <laughs> right. got in under the, under, under the scholarship of being that's my that's my, War, that's my Wharton brother. Wharton brother, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. We both have Jewish in our blood, right. so we have a lot of the same background in history. So, driven by guilt. Driven by guilt, right? <laughs> Jewish mother guilt, a new type of thing that you only know if you go through it yourself. It's a martial art, man. It's martial art, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's weapons and everything else like that. So tell me about, you know, what has shaped you? That can be a two-hour conversation. Yeah, but, real you know, short, I'll give it to you. I wanted to be rich like you. We didn't grow up with much, so I attached my happiness to being rich. And what I learned was money doesn't buy love uh, or happiness. I used to make the joke, it'll rent it, uh, but that's not true. What I learned through my process of making millions, losing millions, and making it back again, real simply, is that money allows you to shop. And shopping makes you happy if you shop for the right things. And it's really important for people. This is my happiest year of my life, I'm 51, because I bought two community centers in Africa impacting millions of people. That's shopping. I'm not, not Mother Teresa, I'm like you. I, I don't walk the streets of Calcutta giving everything away that I own. I don't sit on the streets every weekend handing out food to the homeless. I do what I can when I walk by, but I make a lot of money so I can shop for the right things and impact people in a positive way. Uh, what shaped me to that was losing everything. Uh, because I attached my happiness to money, I wanted to buy my mama a house and a car. It wasn't even about me. I wanted to buy her house and a car. When I did that, I was lost. I shopped for the wrong things, surrounded myself with the wrong people, the wrong ideas. And what changed my life was really, and I, I, I really explored this more than I'm interviewed so much, but the day that I had to go, I was running Lee Steinberg Sports Entertainment, CEO of the, of the most notable sports agency, hired because I was so successful like you at a young age, right? You're Midas. I, how, how did you get that job? How did you strike that position? Right, in, 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 if I unraveled how I got that job, it wasn't because I went to law school, it wasn't because I w was involved in sports like you in college, it really was this. I had developed such great skills extraordinary knowledge, situational knowledge, relationship capital, and I had such a strong desire that was aligned with Lee Steinberg. So how did I get there? My friend asked me to help him. He said, you're one of the best negotiators I've ever met. Can you represent me with my reality show? We're gonna go meet Lee Steinberg. I wasn't looking for a job. 
And so when I went in to meet Lee Steinberg, I was there to be of service to my friend. I impressed him with my skills, my knowledge, and my desire. And the next morning he called me, little did I know Jeff Morad, who later owned the Padres, uh, Jeff had left to go buy into the Diamondbacks. They had sold their baseball practice for 90 million and he was looking for a new executive and called me and said, well, I'd be interested in that position. I think I, I, I believe everything pushes you in the right direction without losing everything, right. without doing all that stuff. I ne all this stuff never would have happened the way it did and I just trust the universe at all times. So I don't see things as no. I, I learn from them, all the lessons, and I also have faith that it's pushing me in the right direction and I'm open to all, I, I don't limit my point of entry. I'm open to all kinds of things. That's why both of our careers are so varied. We do so many more things. That's why we're sitting here both today with microphones in front yes. of us. A year ago, we would have both laughed and you said yes. that we had our own shows, yeah. <laughs> you know? Crazy. But we don't limit our point of entry. We allow the universe to provide us opportunities and we provide value in those opportunities okay. and trust that we're smart enough to make money from it, derive purpose from it, and be passionate about it. We're not passionate first, right? If, if we were driven by passion, both of us would be probably in baseball or football, mm -hmm. making, nothing. making nothing. But we're, dri we're driven by, by profit, right. yeah. and then we figure purpose. We're both purposeful human beings, and then more importantly, we become passionate about it. We don't go, and 99% of the people are like, I just wanna do what I love. No, no. Right. Figure out what makes money, dude. Right. Then figure out a purpose, which is your love, and then be passionate about it, which will make you consistently love it. Consistently love it. Yeah. So you were open-minded, you were paying it forward, adding value, you struck a great job opportunity, which yeah. launched you, and then take us through kind of the path from there. Yeah, so I worked with Lee um, and took a different perspective on the practice, you know, just not agentry. I wanted to build marketing and I wanted to build branding. So I really looked at the legacy side of the brand, the philanthropy side of the brand. Lee had his personal problems. He was an alcoholic. And the hardest thing about working with Lee was that we had to protect the brand and protect Lee. So eventually Warren Moon, the Hall of Fame quarterback and I, who were partners, we had to spin off our own company and leave Lee and let him bottom out. It wasn't hard. It was not only emotionally hard, but imagine this. We wanted to protect Lee, so to the public, this is why I don't care what anyone thinks, because the truth vibrates the fastest, and sooner or later it comes out. I love that. To the, truth, the truth vibrates the fastest. Yeah. That's crazy. Always comes out. Always. And so I don't, I know it'll resolve itself. I don't care about other people's conditions or judgments. I don't care. I want a million people in the world to be impacted by me. 3.999 billion people in the world could not know me or even dislike me. I don't care, because they have the wrong perception. They don't know me then my intentions are pure. Well, Lee, we had to let him bottom out. We had spent millions of dollars. We had taken great risks to protect him. Well, the two years before he went public and sobered up from the time we started our company, we were berated by a lot of people that we left Lee, that Warren stole Dave Meltzer from Lee to run the same company. I can imagine the scrutiny there. Lee even said, because he was an alcoholic, he even at one time said to me, you stole my identity. That was really hurtful. Like I, I had sacrificed, not just me, my entire family had sacrificed so much for Lee Steinberg. Right. And he was projecting because he had a disease. Yes. And now today, truth comes out, so many people called and apologized to me when Lee went public with his alcoholism. And even today, we're so close with Lee, so supportive with Lee. Warren and I both help Lee all the time. We're really close friends. It all came out. Was it like a, a call you and Warren to take the high road? Was it? Let's just let this thing play out so people War will understand. It was driven mostly by Warren more than me because Warren approached me to start the business and my biggest concern was I can't do that to Lee. And then he explained to me, you know, I've known Lee since I was 21 years old. We've done all these things together. This is because he had more experience with this type of behavior and problem and, and disease. I didn't. So he said, Dave, this is to save his life. We're not hurting him. Wow. He said, but we have to protect him. We can't tell people he has this disease. It'll come out but we have to take the high road. Let's just do good business with people that want to do business with us. I love that. And that was how many years ago? 10. 10 years ago. Yeah. So is that after before Warren got inducted? So after. after. So 2009, he got inducted in 2006. Got it. Yeah. So was, it, was that like if you've seen a great friend, uh, like a brother of yours, getting a gold jacket? It, it still happens because I'm so close. You know, we do marketing with the Hall of Fame. I'm so close to so many. Um, the only thing 
that was up there with that is when Seattle won the Super Bowl and Warren got a Super Bowl ring. Because I think the biggest thing that's happening with Warren Moon is one, most people don't realize that he spent six years in Canada because they wouldn't allow a black quarterback. That's so profound. <laughs> most I mean, people don't remember. It seems like a million years ago that that was the way the world worked. Yeah, I, 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 it just hurts me that even some of the young African American quarterbacks, when I tell them that story, they're like, Oh shoot! I just thought he was a Hall of Famer. Imagine his career had he had been played from the beginning. Six more years of stats and numbers. And... It's it's interesting because in all fairness, I love Warren's perspective on it. There's two things he takes perspective that no one knows. One, I don't think I'd be in the Hall of Fame if I didn't go to Canada because I, I got so so fired up and focused. I worked. If I was a pro making a couple million, I'm not sure I would have had the discipline to become the greatest quarterback. You know, but I I was sitting in Edmonton knowing I was the greatest quarterback or had potential to be. So I threw 10,000 passes. I, I, I did everything. I treated my body like a temple. You know, it, sa it saved him in some respects. And that's truly the definition of the hustle. It's taking everything that you can do, every talent you have. I was talking to my old college last week, by old baseball. I asked the kids what they wanted to do. One kid said he wanted to be in the Major League Baseball. I said, great, you better, if your talent's 9.9, .9, you better be a 9.9 .9 in talent, but also in effort. Right. You know, how many people do you see being in the sports industry or in life that just don't reach their potential because they don't have that extra desire, that grit? So many, in fact, the majority, Tick Edelman, right? He's not a 9.9 .9 in person. And he's the MVP of the Super Bowl. He's a 9.9 .9 in effort and attitude. Uh, where the greats are, the Warren Moons, LeBron James, the Michael Jordans, they're born with 9.9 .9 talent. Yes. But they have, you know, the Ben Anderson in them. They have the Dave Meltzer. Yes. You know, in fact, I love Rudy Rudiger. I'm gonna, I'm hosting the Rudy Awards for NCA. We're gonna give a Rudy Award for the best student, the best athlete, and the best business person in college. Yes. The underdog. I love that. But what's cool is Kobe Bryant saying, Rudy was my hero too, Dave. I'm like, what are you talking about, bro? You were born, you're no Rudy. Yes. You're like eighth grade in Italy. Yeah. Everyone's recruiting you. He goes, no. He goes, every time I wasn't working like Rudy, my dad would hand me that DVD, tell me to watch Rudy and don't waste my talent. That's what the movie means to him. Right? He was born, like for us, it's make the most of our talent, mm -hmm. but that applies to people that have all the talent in the world too. Because you don't last unless you make the most of your talent, that 9.9 .9 effort and attitude, which is what makes us successful in business. Yeah, we both have lost games, right? Mm -hmm. And we lose them every day in business. Every day. But we have one thing, we have Rudy's attitude. He's the most persistent person I've ever met. If you think it's extraordinary how he made, got into Notre Dame and got to play, that's extraordinary. The movie's extraordinary. You got to hear the story of how he made the movie because that is incredibly persistent. And that's, I mean, that's, you and I are ex-athletes that never truly made it in our sport. Right. But that, like Warren didn't make it in the NFL from the very beginning, gave us this desire and drive to overcome all obstacles. Right. And it's not fair. Like, it's not fair he went to Canada. But let me tell you one other thing most people don't know. The Buffalo game. Up 32 points at halftime to go to the suit, right? AFC Championship. Oilers, right? The Oilers. Yes. And most people, like, oh, poor Warren. They pulled Warren out of the game. So in history, no one does. And they brought him back too late to bring him back into the game. And then they had a bad call, which nobody ever talks about, where he would have won the game. And you can watch it. If they had a replay today, it, right? It That's wouldn't happen. So, yeah, and most, it's just like most people don't remember Warren went to Canada. This is the problem with perception. Here's the way I see it. I worry about the what. What am I going to do, right? Because I can't achieve it unless I can see it and believe it. And that's what I try to get kids to do. You got to see more. You got to ask big. You, you can't dream about being a pizza delivery boy just because the only strong role model that you have, your dad's dead, your uncles are in prison, and you have one uncle that's a pizza delivery guy. That's right. That can't be your dream. It can't be. Got to be big. So you got to know your what. Then you got to be inspired. You got to understand how every day, and this is what you and I are, because I pull in this parking lot at four in the morning like you do, and you know I'm waiting in the car waving to you. Yes. One day my car broke down. I asked if I could take your Rolls Royce. <laughs> I was like, wait. <laughs> I go, Ben will let me borrow it. <laughs> exactly. Because I was going to the peninsula. I had to yeah. look like I was rich. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we're there at four in the morning. Yeah. And so we, how do you get inspired every day to be there in the gym, at the office? And then the, how do I make my my possibility of what, my probability of inspired why, how do I make it my reality? I'll tell you one thing. It's not just discipline, strategy, and awareness. It's faith. faith. 
And it, I don't care what religion you are, what philosophy or spirituality you believe in, I still define faith. Do I have faith in what I'm doing? Right? Because if you have faith, now you can execute probability to perspective. It actually, faith is what stands between your perception and reality. I when, right? when I have a perception of what I want to be or what I can do, it's only faith that gets me there. Because faith, it's like keeping in business. People ask me, what's the number one rule of entrepreneurship? Stay in business, bro. Every day if you stay in business, eventually it'll evolve into something successful. It might be eight months, might be eight years, might be 80 years, but you'll be a billion dollar company. Stay in business every day. Same thing in life. I have perceptions of what I wanna be. I have to have faith in order to make it my reality. Because I know once I have a perception of what it is, it exists. Now I have to allow it to happen. And faith is the only thing that gets me there. I want to talk about that faith because a lot of our audience is more the industry professionals, real estate agents, and a lot of things are changing for that industry, which is arguably the biggest industry in besides technology maybe in our in our country. Uh, you get wealthy on real estate, buying, and selling homes yeah. more than anything else for the average everyday homeowner. Um, it's a fractured industry. It's a changing industry. It's people have lost lost a lot of faith because of the cycle a couple of years ago. So I want to talk about about someone like you or your caliber that's been around people that are successful, people that make billions, people that make millions. Let's talk about the industry today. Where do you see the housing industry and what advice do you give someone who's losing their faith today? Yeah, number one, our country was founded on one principle, protect the landowner. Right? I'm blessed to be a lawyer, a businessman, a real estate guy. I probably have owned more real estate than most people and fortunately even lost it. <laughs> because I didn't, I took bad assumptions. I didn't have the right help. If anyone should be bitter about the real estate industry, it should be me. I made one bad assumption that I could le always borrow against the equity of my property and didn't realize banks could fail and they had no right to give me money, even though I had huge equity. I lost over $100 million because of one bad assumption. People should have faith in the real estate market because of the inception of our company is to allow us to own land. And every law, believe it or not, is biased towards the landowner. And so it's our job to figure out. Now, it always evolves, but it's a secular, things go up and things go down. But what is remarkable to me is people with faith, they understand if I'm more interested than interesting, if I'm a student of history so I can learn human nature, I actually can make more money when the market changes. That's right. The last thing I want the market to do is stay the same. That's right. The smart people know, I want change. I want in anything. I want change because historically I can figure out how do I make money in mortgage, real estate, title when the market's going down? And how do I make money in those fields when it's going up? How do I make money when people are through a change of automating things, less personalized? How do I make money? And that's where you and I, you know, as co-mentors to each other, I love because you're a great mentor and inspiration to me and living my life with a 360 degree perspective. Yeah. But moreover, you know, I'm helping you understand this perspective of you're changing the face of real estate yes. by providing people a personalized touch with automation and customization, which most people, you got to understand, millennials are the ones who right now are detached from the market That's and right. don't know. There's other gaps in the market where people don't know their own value of a property because they don't understand shared economy of Airbnb and VRBO. So if you're on the rental side of things, I think there's a lot of older 70, 80 year old people that don't know the true value in that area of their, of their properties because right. if they looked at the rental income they could get from VRBO, and I, you know, I, in my opinion, I stole a beach property from someone because they never rented it. They only saw, oh, traditional property managers take 25%. Right. They were doing the math. There's nothing sold for three years, which to me was a great indicator. That's a good market. But how did I learn all that? You know how? Studying history. History. I went to real estate meetings and I found the oldest real estate guys I could find and I took them out to breakfast and, and I said, I just want to take you, I got to pick your brain. Expert. I'm like, yeah, dude, how, did you, how would you make money? And like, what's the, why aren't, I asked them, why aren't people renting these on VRBO? Oh, they don't understand it. Ding. Understand how that. many guys your age own these properties here on the boardwalk? Oh, 90% of us. We go to breakfast every, you know, we meet here for the olive thing. That's right. All of a sudden, I'm like, oh, you all meet there? I'm like, can I come to one of those breakfasts? <laughs> right? I'm not, I'm not like our brothers, right? Right. I, right. I didn't go to war. Stanford rejected me twice, okay? Just, <laughs> they did, undergrad and law school. But what I have over our brothers is 
I understand human nature because I literally ask, hey, and guess what? They all felt super complimented. Like this young guy is asking me for my, they felt important. They oh, felt good. everything they knew with you. Yeah, of course they did because they want me to be rich. Right. They want me to learn. Oh, if I was your age, this is what I do, Dave. Ding. Ding. Yeah. Like, I don't... Who, who's... They're not teaching that at Wharton. It's funny what you learn when you just ask. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Great. Just ask the questions. And help, offer help. help me. Yeah. Help and, me. And offer help to them. Yeah. What, I kept saying to them, they give me these nuggets. I'm like, what can I do for you? Well, well, explain to me what you're talking about. Right? And I'm like, well, this is how VRBO works. So, meanwhile, two of those guys that were at the breakfast are making a fortune like me renting out their property. Wow. Not paying 25% to a property manager that was doing VRBO anyway. Right. So you can literally take the internet, cut the middle person out of it, think like an innovator, how can I use this to make money in the long run, and realize that homes aren't going away, financing's not going away, those things are Our laws aren't going there. away, our, our laws tax aren't laws aren't, exactly. That's it's right. all for the landowner, brother. All for the landowner. Yes. So either get, if you're in this industry, get going on becoming a landowner, partner with smart people that can help you bring those ideas to mind, or find a better way to get financing for those that don't know what you can do with that money. And the other thing you do that's genius, Ben, is you're in the picks and axes, right? So I've learned throughout from mentors, hey, Dave, I don't want to sell gold. I, I don't want to sell gold. I want to sell the picks and the axes that all the millions of people that are going searching for gold. Yes. Right? Tools. So the tools, right? And you have the extraordinary tools. You have the extraordinary background, situational knowledge, experience, and relationship capital to allow people to make their customized choice of who, educated choice of who do I want to help you by how I'm going to help you. So if I only like bald short guys that dress in $5,000 suits, I'm going to see Ben Anderson's picture and be like, that's my man. If I want a schlub that's really smart, that's me, unshaven in my t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> There's someone for everybody. But people like this. And people lose hope. Like last time the recession that w came about, there was like 1.2 million realtors and a million loan officers. And when the recession happened, it number shrunk to like seven or 800,000 of each. And it's because people what, lost faith and lost perspective. What do you think of these big box companies, Purple Brick, Zillow, all these companies looking to kind of cut out the salesperson? And in a way that it maybe isn't best for the consumer because that consumer doesn't get to choose who they work with. You're entering into a blind sales funnel. You're entering in all your information online and then Zillow will ship you off to someone who you don't. Like you said, you didn't just go walk into a random restaurant and say, do you know about real estate? You sought out the person who owned the property on the beach because you knew they were an expert and that allowed you inside of knowledge. Yeah, so, I'll tell you easily. There's a beer commercial out right now that represents exactly why you don't want that. And it shows this robot that's outrunning everybody. He's outperforming everybody. All this stuff is going on that he's doing better than human beings. But in the end, he looks through the window of the pub and the five people that he was competing in all these different sports against and beating them are enjoying each other, having a beer, emotionally connecting to one another, sharing their knowledge in a human way. No matter how powerful artificial intelligence is for Zillow and all these other big box companies that are pretending as if they can understand your needs, people buy on emotion for logical reasons. They don't want to be sold to, they want to go shopping with a friend. A computer cannot be a friend, number one, nor can it truly understand what your needs are because it can't understand your emotions. I love that. Right? You got it. So what do you do? You combine the efficiencies of technology with the emotional aspect of having somebody that can relate to you so you can go shopping with a friend and have someone that you can trust. I love that. That they can understand the subtleties of success, the nuances of success that exist only from personal relationships. So if you want to have a computer that looks from the outside of the pub or do you want someone to have a beer with inside the pub that is going to share in the accountability, in the gratitude, in the forgiveness, in the inspiration of purchasing the most significant purchase of 99% of the people in America's lives. If you want to do that and trust some AI that has no emotional aspect to it, you're a fool.